This morning, as we've been going through, you've seen the candles lit. You may not have been here for all of them, but you remember we started out with the candle of hope, and last week we moved on to the candle of preparation, and today, as as you already know, we're dealing with the the candle of joy. And the one thing about the season of Advent, why, why we're doing this... One thing that I want us to really be overwhelmed with and and where our focus needs to be this Christmas is this. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's that's what this whole thing is about. The incarnation. Let me read to you just some scripture here from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word in the beginning. Not created, it was there. He was there in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what the whole point of of focusing on these different aspects of Advent to, to move our hearts in the direction of that God became a man. That's what Christmas is about. If we miss that, then we've missed the whole point of it. And so we've gone through this and realizing Jesus, who is the Word, our Lord Christ, the Messiah, He's been born. And so we've gone through hope, we've gone through preparation. So today we're going to look at, at hope. And hope, or joy, joy is kind of like hope. And, and when we did hope a couple weeks ago, I asked you guys, when I say it, you're going to have a definition. Joy is probably the same way. When I say joy, there's something in you that's, that's popping up. You have some sort of image or some sort of thought of, of what you think joy is. But I want to read to you a couple of definitions of joy, because joy is one of these things that's, it's almost hard to really get a grasp on. It's defined as a feeling of great happiness. It's also defined as a feeling of pleasure or happiness that comes from success, good fortune, or a sense of well-being. It's also defined as something that gives you pleasure or happiness. Now, most would agree, and and we think about this, we think about happiness, and we kind of put happiness against joy. And when we think of happiness, we think, well, happiness is is kind of a surface thing. It's kind of shallow. But joy is is something that lies really deep. It's more solid. It's it's real. And some of that comes from, from the root words, you know, happiness, happenings. You know, you go up, you go down, you're happy, you're sad, these kind of things. But joy, it's something deeper. But here's the thing, as we define joy, herein lies the big problem with joy. In the definitions I gave you, so much of them are based off of feelings. It's a feeling, it's something that gives you pleasure or happiness. Joy feels good, doesn't it? We want to have joy. But interestingly enough, the opposite of joy, if you look it up, is is misery and trials. So people don't want to go through misery. They don't want to have trials. So in a quest for joy, this deep abiding happiness they're pursuing leads many people down a path of destruction. And don't think that this is just for those who aren't Christians. This happens often with Christians. We're pursuing joy and it takes us down a path that joy is not going to be at the end of it. And so we have to be aware of this. We have to see exactly what it is that the Scriptures are saying about joy. Now, I've, I've been working in my mind and praying through and looking at Scriptures, trying to come up with a definition of joy. I like to define things. I don't know if you guys remember a while ago, I went on the quest to define grace. You guys remember that message? Jenny does. <laughs> One person. Excellent. Okay, I went through and I just went through all these references trying to, to basically get grace nailed down to a definition. And I don't know if you remember that, but I came through it all and realized you can't define it. You can't define it. It's, it's sufficient and it's undefinable because it can be applied to every situation. Joy's kind of like that too. But I did come up with a definition. Here's, here's my working definition of where I'm at with joy. Joy is the ultimate expression of satisfaction in God. Now, when we're satisfied in God, that means we're satisfied in His plans and in His purposes. We're satisfied in His promises. We're satisfied in His will being done, which leads to His glorification. The ultimate expression of satisfaction in God. But there is an aspect of joy, and I, I don't want you to, to don't you know, develop your own definition because there's part of joy you just can't define it, and quite frankly, it shouldn't be defined. You got to be very careful in that. 
Because joy transcends human emotion. It goes way above and beyond that because joy really is a spiritual thing. And that's what we're going to get at here. So I want us to investigate some scriptures this morning about joy. But when I do this, I want you to know that as we're going through this and joy is the topic and we're looking through scriptures, this is not an exhaustive word study in joy. Okay? You may, and I thought about this today because I've had people, um, not here, not here, other churches, come up to me and, and when you're preaching a message on, on a certain topic, they'll say, man, why didn't you use this scripture? Or you should have uh, brought this scripture out. And I like to think that every message, you know, and you're going through it and God's leading you to particular scriptures. Now, here's why I'm saying this. If in this message, God communicates to you a scripture that involves joy, don't look at it as, oh man, pastor should have gone here with, with this. He should have brought this scripture out. Don't minimize what just happened in your life to an inadequate sermon. Every sermon preached is inadequate. Because I am a man and I want God to work through me. But the majority of what you're hearing out of my mouth are my words. I pray the Holy Spirit takes truth and delivers it to your heart. But the best part of any sermon is scriptures. So, every sermon is inadequate on some level. But if you're out there and you're hearing this and God brings to mind a scripture involving joy, that's God communicating with you. So don't don't minimize that. Don't play it off and say, oh, He should have brought this out. Just say, God, You just gave me something. You just spoke to me. So what do you want me to do with that? So as we go through this, if God brings something to your mind, I'm going to tell you, I'm not at all ever insulted to see this out there. This doesn't bother me. Flip through your Bibles. If God's leading you somewhere, then go there. Go there. This bothers me. (laughs) Don't go there. But if God is is bringing something to your mind, remember, the the Word of God is living and active. That means as as we're going through these, God may bring something to your mind that you, you you haven't thought about in so long, but He's communicating with you. So go for it. Find it. Look it up. Let Him take you on whatever journey through Scripture He's taken you on. But don't sleep. Don't sleep. One of the verses that, that really has spoke to me, and, and I realize there's differences in translation, so you may have a different translation in this, but it's Proverbs 10, the fir- verse 28, the first part of it. Now my version and, and some other versions, I think the NIV, the ESV, um, they use the word joy. Some use gladness, so if you have gladness, just substitute joy in there. But Proverbs 10, 28, first part says, The hope of the righteous brings joy. The hope of the righteous brings joy. It's it's an easy verse to even memorize. The hope of the righteous brings joy. And I like this because it really was fitting in with different things and different aspects of the season of Advent. But what is the hope of the righteous? The Scripture's not saying uh, that we're hoping for righteousness. Okay? It is saying the hope of the righteous. And what does it mean to be righteous? It doesn't mean to be doing good stuff. That doesn't mean to be coming to church. It doesn't mean any of that. To be righteous, you must be in Christ. That's where our righteousness, that's the only righteousness that is going to stand up against a holy judge. Because here's the thing, if you go before a holy judge who is sinless and perfect in every way, and you are in your own righteousness, you'll be repelled. There'll be a complete rejection because your righteousness is as filthy rags. So the righteous have to be in Christ because in Christ He imputes or He gives, or I like to always use the terminology, He fills our account, which is nothing but full of just uh, emptiness, fills it with His righteousness. So that when we stand before God, God sees the righteousness of Christ on us. So the hope of the righteous. Now what is that hope? Those who are standing in that right relationship with God, it's through Jesus. That's our hope is that Jesus paid it all. And this isn't and we don't want to rehash the the candle of hope, but it's not a hope like the world hopes. You know, people who are at the ski resorts hope it's going to snow, but they don't know. That's not the kind of hope that we're talking about. Hope in God and trusting in the hope is that God made promises and God doesn't lie. 
And so those will come to pass. That is a rock-solid hope. That's the kind of hope we need to have in God. And so the hope of the righteous, that Jesus paid it all on the cross, that He went to the cross and He was perfect. And again, don't ever... And it's so easy to do this. You can allow little thoughts to creep in your mind. Don't ever think that there wasn't one tiny sin that Jesus had committed His entire life. Not one. Because if He had committed one tiny sin, then He is not a sinless perfection. He is not that that sacrificial lamb, that innocent lamb that we can transfer our sins upon. So... Don't let your mind go there. There were no sins that Jesus had committed, but in His innocence, He took our sins upon Him. We have hope that He paid it all, that He paid it in full. That in trusting in Him, there's no more wrath for us. There's no more punishment that's going to be laid upon us because Jesus paid it all. And when we have that, that brings peace. A deep, abiding peace with God And as we look at this, the hope of the righteous, we're hoping in everything that Jesus did for us because that's what made us righteous, that brings forth joy. This deep, resolute satisfaction in God. And here's the cool thing about joy. You know what joy does? It ignites worship. When we are found and we have that deep satisfaction with God, that is going to ignite our worship. We're not just going to be coming and just kind of sitting there going, Oh, church. It's going to move in us. Because we realize that church is more than just coming to a place and sitting on a nice padded chair. It's worship. It's activity. It's something. It's sacrifice. It's all these things involved. So in looking at that, the hope of the righteous brings joy. Now I want you to turn back, as Matt read earlier in Luke chapter 2. And again, we're kind of drawing out some verses here concerning joy. And he read it, and I'm going to read it again. Luke chapter 2, just verses 10 and 11. Luke 2, verse 10 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Good news of great joy. Now you think about this. What is the good news? From this context, you look at it, the good news is that Jesus was born. Now, that's a fact. That's even a historical fact. That's good news. But what brings about that great joy? I think the great joy in that is found of how Jesus' birth plays out spiritually. Because you think about Jesus being born. It's a miracle, God in the flesh. But He came to die on a cross. That's why He came. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever let Christmas and the Advent... Don't ever leave Jesus as that baby in the manger. Don't do that. He came to die. But He's not dead. He was raised. He is alive. Our sin debt has been paid in full. That's what He was doing. He was tempted just like we are. But yet, He did not give in to that temptation. He did not sin. And that's why we can look to the cross and see Him as our substitute. We see Him as the one who took our place. He didn't deserve it. We deserved it. He took our place. And so thinking about that, that is why there is good news of great joy for unto us this day in the city of David, a Savior, the Messiah, Christ. He's the Lord. He's been born. That brings about great joy. But I also want to look... I want you to, I'm going to make a couple of things, kind of give subheadings on this. Joy is not a dormant thing. Okay? Joy is not sleeping. Isaiah 12, 6 says, Shout and sing for joy. That doesn't mean you're, you're shouting out, Joy, where are you? You know, that's, that's not what that means. That means you're in the midst of joy. You have joy. And that moves you to shout and to sing. Joy isn't something that just we suppress. You know, it's, it's oh, I've got joy. And then you, you look like you don't have joy. You look like you're in pain. You know, joy is something that's alive. It's, it's not sleeping. We're called to shout and sing for joy. It's a beautiful, active thing. But joy also gives clarity. 
Now you can turn to this verse if you want to in James chapter 1. Now in Scripture when you see joy or rejoice, same kind of idea there. But joy gives clarity. Look in James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. Now James is speaking to those 12 tribes who were, who were spread out. Persecution, they were dealing with it. He says, count it all joy, my brothers. It can also mean my sisters as well. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Reckon it complete satisfaction in God when you're going through difficult trials. Anybody here going through difficult trials? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just nod your head. You see it on your face. We go through difficult trials. Here's why you're going through difficult trials. Because you are living in a world that has fallen. It's broken. And so you can expect that. And if you are desiring to live a godly life, then you are definitely going to deal with persecution. That's a promise that we have as Christians. It's not a popular promise, but it's one that we have. But reckon it complete satisfaction in God when you're going through these difficult trials. And remember earlier I said the human, uh, the worldly definition or the opposite of joy is trials? It doesn't even make sense. Count it joy when you're going through the opposite of joy. How do you do that? Well, we're going to get to how you do that. I want to jump ahead though. Not only should joy be, be giving clarity, and joy is not something that's dormant, but joy should be something that we're longing for. Jesus longed for joy. Listen to this verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Speaking about Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, here, here's the, the thing. Jesus had lived an entire sinless life. The only person who ever lived a sinless life. The only one who had ever kept the law fully. Therefore, He wasn't going to die. Okay? Why do we die? We die because we sin. Okay? Jesus was not going to die. But, He sees joy set before Him. It's right there in front of Him. But there's something in between that, and that's the cross. And so for the joy set before him, he sees it, he's longing for it, he's moving toward it, he endures the cross. Now the cross was hideous, it was horrible, it was torture, it was shame, it was ugly, nasty, bloody, all of these things. But upon that cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So you can, you can take the physical aspect of it, and it's detestable, but there's a whole spiritual aspect going on as well. There's darkness and lots of things happening there on the cross that you don't just necessarily see, and you really don't see them in a lot of paintings that depict it. I mean, it was brutal, and that's not even doing enough justice to it. But for the joy that was set before him, so he's moving toward this joy, he endured the cross. You know, he could have stopped it at any time. He could have said, wait a minute, I didn't sin. I, I don't need this. But he didn't. Because he knew that unless he died in our place, unless he laid down his life, we would have no hope. Because you can look through the Old Testament. They made sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices. They shed the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. And it only covered sin. It didn't wash it away. It didn't pay that full price because they had to do it year after year after year after year after year. But Jesus went to the cross, endured the cross, died on the cross, despising the shame. The cross was a shameful, shameful thing. It was done in public, in broad view, so everybody could see. Oh, look at this person. He's committed a crime. What a horrible, horrible person this is. Stripped naked, up there bleeding on a cross as people walked by. Jesus endured that, despising the shame of it, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where Jesus is right now, at the right hand of the Father, waiting to come back. 
And don't ever miss that as we celebrate the season of Advent, we're looking forward to that second Advent. We're looking forward to that second time when He comes, His his return. That's what we long for. That's what we should be longing for. But He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I'm going to read Psalm 16, verse 11. I know I'm reading a bunch of scriptures. If you've got fast fingers, you can turn there if you want to just jot it down. But Psalm 1611 takes everything that we've been talking about and the fact that joy should be something we're longing for and looking at Jesus enduring the cross for the joy set before Him kind of brings it together. Psalmist writes, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. The joy set before him, Jesus sees it, and he endures the cross to get there. Guess what? He was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He was going to go through what he went through. He was going to die. He was going to be raised from the dead. And he was going to be put back in heaven where he rightly belongs. Enthroned in the heavens above. Lord of all. It's who Jesus is. You make known to me the path of my life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. A fullness of complete satisfaction when I'm in your presence, God. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Who's at the right hand? Jesus. In Jesus we have eternal life. We have no clue what eternal life is, quite frankly. We have no clue. I mean, we we know it and, and we have it, but I mean, we really have no clue what it is. We're going to experience it. It's going to blow our minds when we get to heaven. All of these things are going to happen. So so get ready, because it's probably nothing like what you think it is. And I mean that in a good way. But we've laid all these things out, seen all these scriptures about joy. Now I ask the question, do you have joy? Do you have joy? Why don't Christians have joy? It's It's a... that can be a heavy question, can it? I mean, that can weigh on a lot of our hearts. Why don't we have joy? Here's why Christians don't have joy. Because we've believed the lie that joy is merely a form of happiness. That's what we've done. It's like happiness on steroids. That's what we think joy is. You know, It's like, oh man, uh, I want to be happy. I'm not happy. I don't have joy. But hey, if this makes me happy and really happy, and it's not just on the surface, but something deep inside, I have joy. It's not joy. It's not true joy. Because true joy is spiritual. This will be the last place I ask you to turn. Galatians chapter 5. True joy is spiritual. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. I'm going to go down to about verse 24. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. But Verse 16, Paul's writing. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit... You're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now here's the thing, and there's a warning in this. As I, as I read through this and kind of went through this, we've got to be warned on this. All of the works of the flesh that I just read in this, that we just saw sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, and on and on, those can cause human joy. People can be in the midst of these and say, wow, man, this is giving me such joy. I was longing for happiness, and so now I'm in this relationship, and man, it feels good, and it's so joyful. It's not the kind of joy we're talking about. But here's another warning. All the fruits of the Spirit can be produced humanly. Look at this. 
Here's the fruits of the Spirit. Love. Do you know people who don't know Christ who love? I do. People who don't know Christ can have joy. They say they have joy. Without Christ, is there peace? Well, yeah, if we're not fighting, there's peace. People who aren't Christians, some are patient. Some are kind. Some are good. Some are faithful. Some are gentle. Some exhibit self-control. So all the fruits of the Spirit can be produced humanly. But here's the thing, Christian. We are not called to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You don't produce it. You don't sit there and work and say, oh, I'm trying so hard to to have this fruit pop out of me. You bear it. You bear it. You think of it. Think of a fruit tree. Think of apple trees. You know, how do you know it's an apple tree? It bears its fruit. The apples are just hanging on it. It's what it's doing. It's bearing this fruit. You know, Jesus spoke about it. You know, a good tree is not going to bear bad fruit, and a bad tree is not going to bear good fruit, and you're going to know a tree by its fruit. That's the thing. We are called to bear the fruit of the Spirit. It's a spiritual thing, and it is an inability in yourself to produce this in the true spiritual sense. It's not going to happen. So joy is evidence that we are filled, not just indwelled, filled with the Spirit of God and are walking in Him. Joy is evidence of that. You're bearing that because the Spirit of God isn't just in you, but dominating you. And so if joy is a fruit of the Spirit, that means joy is within God. That's what that really means. Joy exists in God eternally. It's part of who God is. And so God the Spirit lives inside of you, and the fruit of that is joy. That tells me that joy is within God. And we're thinking about, and we've gone through it, and how many people are on this pursuit to find joy in so many things that are less than God. It's just not right. It's not what God would have for you. God wants you to have joy, yes. God wants you to bear joy. But He wants it to come from His Holy Spirit living inside of you, dominating, working, moving, changing, all of these things. So I ask the question again, why don't we have joy? You're not going to find joy in another person. You're not going to find it in your spouse or your marriage. You're not going to find it in your church or your pastor. You're not going to find it in your job. You're not going to find it in money. You're not going to find it in things. You're not going to find it there. So why don't we have joy? I guess a better question is, does the Holy Spirit dominate your life? Is He the one that's moving inside of you and leading you? Are you walking in the Spirit, as Paul said? But I say, walk by the Spirit. And he says in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, that's what, you know, why do we have the Holy Spirit? Just to claim we have the Holy Spirit? No, we have it so that we can produce, the, or so the fruit of God is living in our lives, so we walk in Him and move in Him and have that, that constant communion with the true and living God. There's more to it than that, but that's part of why we have the Holy Spirit. So, I ask the question, why don't you have joy? Does the Holy Spirit dominate your life? If you are pursuing joy, without God, you're not going to have joy. So if you're pursuing joy... Go to God. Go to God. That's the answer to that. If you want joy in your life, go to God. But Christian, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I just don't have joy in my life. I I don't have joy. And you know it. People around you probably know it. Christian, if you don't have joy, go to God. He's the answer for both of those. If you're lost and you want joy, go to God. And the only way you get to God is through Christ. Christian, if you are a Christian, you already know God through Christ, and you want joy, go to God. It's the Spirit who lives inside of you that is working, and you're bearing that fruit that He is so evident in your life, and working through you, and guiding you, and and giving you the thoughts, and all of these things that you need to live that Christian life. He is enabling you to do that. That's where joy is found, in God. So whatever your pursuit of joy is, wherever you are on that spectrum, God is the answer. It's found fully in Him and in His presence. 
Let's pray. Father, in your presence, the, we have fullness of joy. It's a joy that a world that tries to push you out, to deny you, the world knows no joy like that. The hope of the righteous brings joy. Lord, let us be completely satisfied in You this Christmas. That You're it, and You're all we need. And we know that in You, Lord, there is fullness of joy. That's what we need. Help that to be our prayer. Help help that to be something that we're praying for every day. God, I want more of You. I need You. And as we have You and Your Spirit as He's living inside of us and moving and and working and loving and all of these things inside of us, we're going to have joy. And it's a joy that really, and God, we can't define it. I don't even know if we can comprehend it. Because it's in You. It's, It's who You are. And because You have given us Your Holy Spirit, that's produced in us. May we be on guard never to try to produce the fruits of the Spirit in and of ourselves, in our works, and in our efforts, but just yield to You. Yield to You as Your Spirit is living and moving inside of us. And may we bear that fruit for the glory of Your name. Give us joy. Give us Jesus. We pray this in His name. Amen.